welcome to the Snack Bar. My name is Geraldine, and with me I have. Hi, I'm Jet Yong, and welcome to the final Snack Bar of 2016. Unless I I take a very long time to edit this audio like I did the last time. I'm so sorry about that. There were some issues with the website, but uh, luckily I fixed it. That's okay. Um, in any case, it'll be the last one recorded in 2016. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a long time since we've done this. So I won't waste any more of your time, Chad. I'm, I'm sure you've seen plenty of movies the past three weeks. So is there anything you'd like to talk about? Yeah, before we get to the main event, did you manage to catch La La Land? Nope. All right. I couldn't catch anything on Christmas weekend. Oh, that's okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed Christmas all the same. Yeah, I hope you did too. Thank you. I had a great time singing yesterday. Oh, that's fun. Six, I think it was like five hours of karaoke. Oh my gosh, is your voice all right? Yeah, surprisingly, it's it's fine. In fact, I think I'm a lot louder <laughs> than <laughs> I am. That's good. You got practice, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I guess. All right, so um, let's go in on to Passengers first. So this is the one that people apparently hate right now. And uh, it has Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt in it. They are two passengers on a colony ship that is bound for a far away colony planet. And Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt wake up 90 years ahead of schedule, find themselves alone on the ship. But there's a little bit more to it than that. I've read, like, you know, the piece about how Jennifer Lawrence plays the sexy character and there isn't much to her. I mean, I heard it's a very sexist movie. And I've read why and I kind of understand why. I'm not sure that we can say this because it's part of the spoilers. Yeah, it's a bit of a spoiler, but at the same time, it is the premise of the film. So I had to try and dance around it in my review. But the very first thing I heard about this movie when I was compiling the list of movies that are coming out in 2016 was this premise, was the reason why people are saying it's sexist. Mm -hmm. So I understand that perspective and maybe it's just a part of who I am, but I didn't really find that that was a huge problem for me. Like I'm not discounting people who have this opinion. I think what I got away from the film is it did talk about uh, despair, isolation, loneliness, the need for the companionship of another human being. And how it deals with that is perhaps not ideal. But at the same time, I don't think it's particularly condoning uh, the actions that the the character takes, even though some people describe it as Stockholm Syndrome. Well, you could also say Beauty and the Beast is Stockholm Syndrome. So, I will yeah. argue against that. <laughs> Once we get to Beauty and the Beast next year. Yeah, we'll, Which I'm very excited for, by the way. I, I, I don't actually subscribe to the Stockholm Syndrome uh, interpretation of Beauty and the Beast, yeah, but we'll get to that. Well, this movie, I think design-wise, a lot of aspects of it reminded me of Wally. -E. It's like Wally -E with human beings. It's very white. Uh, the scene. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's a post-Apple sort of design and the idea of the Avalon is that it's kind of a cruise luxury cruise ship so the passengers are awoken for they're supposed to be awoken four months before it lands so they can enjoy the facilities of the Avalon as a cruise ship so it's got a bit of an axiom vibe to it and it's a production mm -hmm. designed by Guy Hendrix Diaz who did Interstellar and Inception for Christopher Nolan mm. so there's lots of cool design stuff going on there's there's a pool that's really nice I do want to swim in that pool uh, and you have Michael Sheen as an android bartender, and he's very deliberately invoking the character of Lloyd from The Shining. He's dressed the same way, the way they light him at the bar is the same way as Lloyd. It's kind of an interesting idea. And how was how were the chemistry between... I mean, I really like the chemistry during the interviews, but then again, I like the chemistry between Jennifer Lawrence and Josh Hutchison. Hutchison yeah. In the interviews, but they're so terrible on film. Is that the same here for Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence? I think they did well. I think they're well matched. And at one point of time, this is going to have Keanu Reeves and Reese Witherspoon in it, which I don't think would have worked at all. I can't picture the both of them together in the same context. I think it's it plays they play off of each other, and there's a bit of a romantic comedy vibe to it. And you have a huge misunderstanding uh, at the end of your second act, which you expect and then when they come into conflict I think she plays it quite well but he's on screen for a lot longer than she is and mm -hmm. he's he's paid a lot less than she is as we all know the drama surrounding that I don't want to make that into too much of a big deal because you know she's where she is for a reason and I like the both of them together 
I think part of the reason why I didn't have as big a problem with this as a lot of other people have is, I guess I'm coming at it from the point of view of I would not necessarily do what uh, Chris Pratt's character did in the film, but I can understand why that thought would cross your mind. So whether or not you would act on it is something different altogether. And I, I don't think it treats it particularly as saying there are no consequences, there are no implications. And uh, what disappointed me is the tagline on the poster is there's a reason they woke up. When they tell you the reason, you're like, really, is that it? So I was expecting there to be a huge conspiracy that these two characters are caught up in. And then when they tell you the reason, you're kind of mad about it. So it doesn't deliver on the promise of that mind-bending sort of sci-fi finale, which I was hoping for. It's kind of an action-oriented ending. This sounds like a very good aeroplane movie. I think so, yeah. I, I don't... I don't think it's as objectionable as people are making it out to be, but I can't speak for everyone. And you have that if you have that point of view, I can see where you're coming from because a lot of people are like, imagine if it were not as an attractive a guy as Chris Pratt, if it was Steve yeah. Buscemi and Jennifer Lawrence or in this thing, how whether or not it would be, whether you would have more of a problem with it because the guy is unattractive. Yeah. But I think that it raises some interesting questions. I don't think it answers those questions particularly well. But if you can try and watch it without getting angry, I would say give it a chance. And if you come out of it really, really mad, that's your right to be angry with it. And I'm not going to tell you how to feel, but I, I wasn't angry with it. Okay. Yeah, that's that's. Passengers. By the way, you said that this is this is the film everyone hates. Now, I disagree with you. I think a lot of people hate Assassin's Creed more. Oh, yeah, let's go on to that. I'm, yeah. I'm very curious about how you feel about that. I really wanted to watch it, and then I heard the reviews were terrible. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to pay money to watch, you know, a, a very dumb film. Right. And, and I heard, like, it's one third of the historical part, and I love history, so that's why I'm interested in Assassin's Creed, even though I've never played any of the games. But... You know, to me, it, it's always fascinating when they go back in time and then you see how they how they interact with the historical things that happened during that time. Then I heard this one only had one third of the history of the Spanish Inquisition. So I'm like, I'm not going to watch that. Yeah, the best parts of the film are the parts that are set during the Spanish Inquisition, but it is about one third. Most of it uh, revolves around the... They're trying to explain the whole conspiracy, the millennia-long battle between the two factions, the Templars and the Assassins. And it's done in such a way where there's so much really silly exposition, but it's taken so seriously. Everyone is delivering it with such a straight face. And every line they say makes it more confusing. It doesn't clear things up. But before I get any further into what I thought about Assassin's Creed, I remember you mentioning that you did some work on this while you were at Double Negative. Could you tell us about that? No, You'd... I can just tell you it's kind of shit. But <laughs> but um, we are. We, I did do some of uh. There's there's this new film coming out that's like a horror psychological thriller, um, Cure for Wellness. Oh, cool! Yeah, that film actually looks really. Cool. I'm looking forward to that. That seems like it would be quite disturbing. And it's Gore Verbinski going back good. to horror. He did the Pirates of Caribbean films, but before that, I think he did the American remake of The Ring, which apparently is one of the better. American remakes of Japanese horror films. So anyway, back to Assassin's Creed. I have gone on record as saying that I was hoping this would be the movie that would change the tide of negative reception towards video game movies. That this would be the one to open the floodgates and usher in a you know a new golden age for video game movies. And I was very very wrong. Uh, the reason I thought that was because this has Justin Cazell on it. Justin Cazell did a pretty good adaptation of Macbeth with these two stars, with Marion Cotillard and with Michael Fassbender. So Michael Fassbender is on board as a producer and a star, and he brought back, he brought back not only uh, the director and his co-star, he also brought back Adam Arkhipov, who is the cinematographer. And I think I watched it with my brother, and he said it has everything except a good story. And mm -hmm. it's it's really a shame, because you look at a post that goes Academy Award nominee Michael Fassbender, Academy Award winner Marin Cotillard, Academy Award winner Jeremy Irons, and they're like, okay, so they are promoting a video game movie by telling you that the... They're being serious about it. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, that is kind of its undoing. It's so serious. 
And the premise is really, really ridiculous because I understand that the idea behind the Assassin's Creed games, that really is a rich premise. The mythology is so vast, so dense, and some of it is absolutely clever. But the way it's done in the movie is really, really clumsy. And uh, the whole MacGuffin is this thing called the Apple of Eden. And in the games, the Apple of Eden is an artifact created by a forerunner race called the Isu, who are kind of worshipped as gods. Well, in the movie, the Apple of Eden contains the origins of free will. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> what does that mean? And it, it's it's really, really frustrating because they are being so vague and they are being so inscrutable and it's supposed to come off as artistic, but it's just clumsy and awkward. And yeah, it's uh, there's... I love, love, love Michael Fassbender. He's one of my big man crushes. I really didn't like him in this film for some reason. I thought there's not very much of the protagonist at all. And they give him a tragic backstory, but the way they handle that is really hand-fisted, where it's kind of like, so what exactly happened to you? I still don't know. Uh, one aspect of the movie I did really like was there's a small group of other people being held at the same facility at Abstergo, the same facility that Michael Fassbender's character Callum is being held, and they are staging this little coup. So they're trying to stage an uprising against the guards at this facility. I kind of like that. Ah, uh, well, that that wasn't very convincing to make me watch the movie. No, don't, I... don't pay a lot of money for it. But I don't think it's a complete train wreck. I gave it a 2.5 out of 5. I think... Well, to me... Th- the game, the video game movie I was right, I was hoping would change the type of video game movies was Warcraft. Right, yeah. Because fantasy was my type of, I, I love fantasy films. And also because I loved, um, I I really love that train movie. What's it called? Snowpiercer. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, oh, oh Source Code. Source Code, yes. Source Code is amazing. So I was really hoping that that, that movie would change it. And then Warcraft didn't do it. And when I saw the Assassin's Creed trailer, I'm like, I don't think this is the movie that's going to do it too. No, so there are yeah. other video game movies that are coming out, like Tomb Raider. Yeah, that looks promising because Alicia Vikander, and also they hired Walton Goggins as the villain. Walton Goggins is this really underrated actor who is a brilliant psychopath. He's really entertaining when he's a, when he's a villain. And Detective Pikachu? I think Detective <laughs> Pikachu... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm relying on Detective Pikachu to turn the tide because... That film has every right to be as silly as a video game movie is. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that so, could work. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's the one where... I don't know. I think that has the most potential to not suck. Right, yeah. And and Duncan Jones, he is returning to his smaller scale sci-fi roots with this film for Netflix called Mute, which is kind of in mm-hmm. the vein of Blade Runner. It has Alexander Skarsgård and is set in Berlin in like 2040 or something like that where he... He's a mute bartender who goes into the criminal underworld of the future to search for this for, for this lost woman. It sounds interesting. Yeah, it does. Any, anything else you watched this week or last week? or? Yeah, week um, Patriot's Day. I just watched that and that's coming out, I think, 12th or 19th of January, somewhere around there. So this is an Oscar bait kind of thing. It's directed by Peter Berg and stars Mark Wahlberg, just like Lone Survivor and Deepwater Horizon. So it is based on the Boston Marathon bombings in 2013, oh. yeah, perpetrated by Johan Tamerlin Saneev. So Mark Wahlberg plays a fictional composite character. So this character that he's playing, Tommy Saunders, did not exist in real life. So he is a plot device used to string together all of the real events. So you see it through his POV and he is conveniently at all of the important places at all of the important times. So you see what happened. I think with this movie, the big discussion is, is it exploitative or not? Is it too soon or not? How do you quantify that? And Honestly, I do think it's too soon. Yeah, it's a very difficult conversation to have because I don't want to blanket dismiss it one way or another. And I have made the effort to, you know, after watching this and writing my review, to go and read both positive and negative reviews. And I think the negative review written by Tiber of the Boston Globe is really worth reading because it's the perspective of somebody who the events uh, directly or, or, or like close indirectly affected him as someone who lives in Boston. And yeah, I think that when you film 
at the finish line of the marathon this year, this movie, it's, you know, it's kind of like the wound is still fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, I, I think that they did try to be respectful that it is, it feels reasonably sincere. And the one subplot that really stood out to me is the story of Dun Ming, played by Jimmy O. Yang. And he is a Chinese national an app developer in Boston, and his car was carjacked by Johan Tamerlan Sané. So his part of the story is the most intense to me and the most frightening and really well acted because Jimmy O. Young is a comedian. He's on Silicon Valley, but he did quite a good job uh, with, with a dramatic role. And then you've got Kevin Bacon in this, you've got John Goodman in this, quite a number of good actors. J.K. Simmons? J.K. Simmons is great in this movie. He's J.K. Simmons is in everything. Yeah, yeah, he's he's basically doing a dry run for Commissioner Gordon because he plays like a police uh, officer in Watertown, which is the small town near Boston where they had the big firefight with the two terrorists. Mm. And that sequence is superb. It's scary. It's intense. It's not glossy and slow motion. It feels you feel the explosions. You feel the gunfire. And then after that, you have to step back and go, wait a minute, am I allowed to enjoy this on the basis of it being an action scene? So I found myself like going down this spiral, this slippery slope after watching this movie. And it's really difficult for me to come to a conclusion to where I fall on how exploitative it is, whether it should have been made at all, it should have been made later, is it the approach? Yeah, so I have complicated uh, views on Patriot's Day. I mean, to me, it's good that these kind of movies are made because I think history itself is important to prevent history from repeating itself. But I I do think that this film is way too early. Like, it's only, what, been three years since the event? Yeah. And people yeah. are still recovering from it. And I don't think it's very respectful of them to do so in such... And, and I mean, the the reason why films are made anyway... It's to make money most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Especially so, if it's a studio thing, if you've got a big director, big star, it's always the first priority is profit. Yeah, so I don't like that this film was made at all. But, I mean, if it's... It's, it's not my right to say what you should and shouldn't do. And if this film is made, at least it's done well. Yeah, yeah. That, I think as a thriller, as a procedural, it's constructed well you get a good view overview of the how they went about piecing together the aftermath and trying to track down the perpetrators. But I think certain aspects are very are oversimplified and they completely did not mention uh, Sunil Tripathi, who is this student. He was hounded by online vigilantes who mistakenly thought he was the bomber and then he mm. apparently committed suicide. Because of all what? the harassment that we see. Wait, I didn't hear that. I heard of that, but I didn't hear about the committing suicide he, part. He died. It was ruled a suicide. He died oh. like several days after. Yeah, I initially I thought that someone had killed him, and but when I went and read about it, it was it said that it was ruled a suicide. So that is very very tragic, and that's a complicated thing to talk about. You know, racial profiling, bigotry, online vigilantism, people going on Reddit and all of those places and trying to play detective by themselves, and the consequences it can have in real life. So I understand why they left out of the film, but at the same time, I think that that's important enough to talk about. You know, mm. the yeah. when you take the law into your own hands and you act from your impulses and the consequences you can have to innocent people. Um. Okay. Do you want to talk about the main event now? Yeah. So it's oh, your thing. It is my thing, indeed. Yeah. This is a uh, the last one of the last big blockbusters of the year, and and. I I think it went on, it it went out with a with a bang. So uh, let's talk about Rogue One. Yeah, the, Rogue the, the One, Star Wars, the Star Wars story. story. That's right. The, how, I I don't remember how the Star Wars theme sounds like now. Something like that. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> Jed, what what is Rogue One about? Rogue One is the first anthology film uh, in the Star Wars series. So this is a spin-off. It's not set in the main line of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And this is set just before the events of Episode 4, A New Hope. So during the opening crawl of Episode 4, you would have seen a line in the opening crawl that says something like, the rebels have been victorious against the Empire and rebel spies have captured the plans to the Death Star. So this movie 
details that, and it revolves around a character named Jin Erso, who is played by Felicity Jones. She's the daughter of Galen Erso, played by, apparently it's pronounced like this, Maz Miggleson. And he is an imperial science officer who is tasked with developing the technology that goes into the Death Star, and he is having second thoughts about his allegiance to the Empire, but he has been forced into it by director Orson Krennic, played by Ben Mendelsohn. So Orson Krennic is overseeing the construction of the Death Star, and Jin Erso has been living under the care of Saw Guerrera, played by Forrest Whitaker. He's a freedom fighter, kind of an extremist, who is a veteran of the Clone Wars, and his sister died during the Clone Wars. He lost his legs. And his actions are not explicitly endorsed by the Rebel Alliance because they find him a bit of an extremist. So Jin Erso is drafted into the Rebel Alliance uh, alongside Captain Cassian Andor, played by Diego Luna, who is an experienced Rebel intelligence officer. And their mission is to get in contact with Galen Erso and retrieve the plans for the Death Star. So how this comes about is Galen Erso has sent Bodhi Rook, played by Riz Ahmed, a pilot who has defected from the Empire to transmit a message to the rebels. So Jin, Cassian Andor, and the droid K2SO, voiced by Alan Tudyk, who is a reprogrammed Imperial droid, they go off on this adventure to, to uh, capture the plans of Death Star. Along the way, they meet Chiru Imwe, played by Donnie Yen, and Baze Malbus, played by Jiang Wen. So these two are the Guardians of the Wills, and they are former members of uh, a religion called uh, a religion that worships the Force, but they're not Jedi. So Chirut is this like blind warrior monk, and then Baze is this gruff mercenary who totes a huge chain gun, and uh, they go on this adventure to fight the Empire, get the plans of the Death Star, and hovering around in the background is, of course, Darth Vader, uh, voiced once again by James Earl Jones. Sorry. Yeah, Darth Vader is not a very well-known character, and he is not one of the greatest screen villains of all time, but you might recognize him when you see him. Yeah, so yeah. that's Rogue One. Okay, so as a Star Wars fan, was this your Fantastic Beast? You love it as much as I love that film. I did, yeah. Every five minutes, I turned to my brother my watches with, and we were both so thrilled. We were going, ah, 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 every five minutes. And it has a little bit of a slow start, but I was riveted from the beginning. I felt mm, that, yeah, yeah I, I felt that this did everything I was hoping it would do, and that I was expecting it out of a film of this type, which is make a war film set within the Star Wars universe. I think it was just dark enough it was just mature enough. And one thing I really enjoyed about the story is you got a lot of shades of grey. Because Star Wars is a lot of moral absolution. Black is black, mm -hmm. white is white. No good is good, bad is bad. And in this one, you have the fog of war. You have the confusion. You have the uh, the greyness that the good guys might not always do good things. Bad guys might not always do bad things. And you can't really come down cleanly on who's right and who's wrong, which is something that I've wanted out of Star Wars for a while. I really like this film as well. Yay! I mean, Yay. Like you said, the, the fun part was kind of... Well, actually, to be fair, I, I didn't mind the slow beginning. Neither did I. Not at all, actually. To me, to me, it was just set up. Yeah. And it was good set up. Yeah, and if you don't have a good foundation, then you don't really have a good movie to go on with. So to me, I didn't mind the, the setup, even though they went to way too many planets for my <laughs> But I like Jean or so. I mean... To be fair, all the characters are really thin. They they only have... So, I mean, because... I don't know how to say this. I don't blame the story for having thin characters because the story is taking front and center here. And I didn't mind that, you know, Jean Ursa wasn't that interesting. But I, for what we were given, I think I cared about her enough. It's just that... When the emotional parts come, I didn't really feel much. But I did like the story. I did like the setup. I thought like the battle scenes were really cool, very amazing to watch. And yeah, I, I really like this film. I think I think this is one of my favorite Star Wars films. 
Am I allowed to say that? You definitely are. You're not alone in that. A lot of people are saying this is just behind Empire or tied with Empire for them, which is a big statement to make. Yeah, I, I really liked the third act, even though it was way too slow. I mean, it, it, it slowed down at one point, and I felt mm. like there were a lot of things going on in the third act, but I really love how this film concluded. And you know me, I hate fan service like crazy. Yeah, but yeah. I think, I think out of every single film, even more so than Force Awakens, this film deserves the amount of fan service it got because it helped, a, it helped with the story along the way. And yeah, and you know, it's just, it's kind of cute to see some characters come back mm -hmm. from right, yeah. A New Hope. And if you are a huge Star Wars geek, there's so many things to look out for. So many things which you won't catch even on the second or third viewing. So let's go um, to what you said about the characters and them being kind of thin, but it's because of the structure of the story. I more or less agree with you. I think that as far as the plot is concerned, this is a foregone conclusion. We know how this story is going to end. But even given that, I was really invested in these characters. I really wanted to follow their journey and I felt for them. And I think that they were established and they were drawn clearly enough and they all fit into the Star Wars world. None of the characters feel like they shouldn't belong there or that they were shoved in later by some sort of executive decision. And what I find most impressive about Rogue One is this is a movie that was completely reassembled in post-production. The initial yeah. trailers have so much footage that did not make it into the final cut, which indicates that after some test screenings, they went back and they did reshoots and they re-edited it. And this is almost seamless. I can't tell what originally was the intent i can't it doesn't feel choppy at all it's real. i think it's really tight in terms of how the story flows and i think the conclusion the ending is so damn solid so i think they did a really really good job and i'm super curious as to see what it looked like at first what it looked like on paper and what gareth edwards did at first because i'm sure this was really really different from how it originally was how did you think the visual effects were. Were there like some parts where they use physical ships? Yes, I'm pretty sure I'm the Star God. Destroyers are miniatures, which thrilled it, me to no end. Yeah. Well, to me, it was really weird because they kind of looked like Legos, but I couldn't tell whether it was because it was computer graphics or whether it was. It looked really fake for some reason, so I, I, I can't tell whether it's because it's CG or because it's, it's actually toys that are from Lego. I mean, is it me that, that saw Lego in those ships? These are definitely, I I you know, these are definitely not built with Lego. Uh, if you go back and you <laughs> look at episode 4, and the opening scene of episode 4, you have a giant Star Destroyer chasing down the little Rebel Rocket Runner. So that is, those mm -hmm. two are models. And I think that this yeah. has the look of that. So you have, I'm not sure whether or not the Star Destroyers were practical for every single shot. I'm pretty sure there are some shots where they were CG. But even when they were CG, I think they were purposely designed to evoke the look of miniatures. At the same time, these miniatures are not small. Like, one of these things is probably about 3-4 meters long. I've, I've seen, like, exhibits and traveling stuff when they came to Singapore. They had models of, of, of the Star Destroyers that they used. And in fact, there are so many miniature models that are used in the prequels that are mm -hmm. kind of invisible because everything is coated in a lot of CG that you don't realize how much of it is built practically. Yeah, the visual effects, uh, I thought the visual effects worked really well. I think the final space battle was spectacular. Uh, yeah, that's, amazing. That was so good. There were so many moments in that that were like, how come this hasn't been done yet in Star Wars? They kept on finding inventive things to do and fun ideas that were executed on such a grand scale. And I don't think this felt smaller in scale it than not. The Force Awakens, which I was surprised by because as a spin-off, you expect it to be, okay, this is an offshoot. So this is people who are doing something uh, smaller in their free time. No, not at all. They went to all of those planets. The set design was so extensive and really kept the feeling of Episode 4 when they were in crowded marketplaces and everything felt dirty. It felt lived in. There was a used future feel, which is one of the signatures of the original trilogy. 
and every time there's explosions and bullet hits and stuff, it all feels like it was there. So I was very happy with that. Yeah. I, oh, I can't say this. Spoiler. But let's just say something cut into something and I thought that part was so cool. I was like, I was oh, very, very happy when that damn. happened. Yeah. Something yeah, cut into amazing. something. Yeah, there's stuff that smashes into stuff and, oh, and, and I think the beach battle on Scarif that was filmed in the Maldives, I liked that sort of atmosphere. I like the idea of, you know, a paradise that's gone to hell because mm -hmm. it's in the middle of a war zone. And I think that each of the planets they went to were different enough in the environment. I love the atmosphere of Edu, which is this stormy, you know, planet with craggy canyons and it's all on buttresses and cliffs. That was really, really great. And they had a very dramatic scene that was set there that I felt the atmosphere really enriched that scene. Yeah. Oh, and, and when you go back to Yavin 4, the moon where which is the rebel base, then you have the full on fan service, you see all of the rebels, some you recognize, some you don't, you know, Mon Mothma comes back, played by Jean Revo Riley, and so there's Bail Organa, played by Jimmy Smith, and you're like, hey, look at these guys. So what is fun is that it bridges the prequels and the original trilogy in a way that feels closer to the original trilogy than the prequels, but doesn't ignore the prequels completely. I like that. Yeah, I I, I really love that they do acknowledge that the prequels do exist. I mean, I know a lot of a lot of Star Wars fans try to ignore it, but I think there were a lot of good ideas in the prequels. They were just done in a really boring way. But I like how... Because people did work on the prequels. And I, it's kind of sad to see the prequels getting so shit on. Yeah, that it's all tarred with the same brush. And, and it's like... The reason why I love the X-Men films is because they even acknowledge things from the bad X-Men films. Right, yeah. Which... I, I, I really appreciate that they kind of own up to it and they try to make things better in a way. Like, oh, at least, you know, you you didn't have to acknowledge it because we all know it sucked. But it's nice that you kind of want to be loyal to the law. So you have that there. Right, yeah. Well, where I come down on it is with the prequels. George Lucas is a good ideas man. He's not a good writer of dialogue and he's not a good director of actors, which unfortunately as a writer-director you have to be. And with Empire Strikes Back, that was directed by Irvin Kirshner and co-written with Lawrence Kasdan. So you had other hands stirring the stew. And in the prequels, they gave him so much creative control that all of the ideas were his. But there are some really, really good ideas. The one example I will give is, okay, in episode one, Anakin Skywalker gives his little necklace that he carved out of wood to Padme, right? The Jaipur snippet. And he says, yeah. you know, this is for you. Uh, I, I I kind of have a crush on you. This is a thing. And you see that Jaipur snippet again. She is wearing that during her funeral when they wheel her out during the procession on cars. Yeah. And they zoom in on the Jaipur snippet. And I was like, that is such a strong emotional threat. Even as hokey as the dialogue is, even as poorly developed as the romance was, that visual idea is heartbreaking, you know? Yeah. 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 That's it. Unfortunately, I can't say too much about Star Wars because I don't know much about it. I kind of know the backstory because I read, um, what's that book called? It's a really good book. It's like, oh, never mind. Forget it. I'll, I'll put it inside the summary. But oh, how did you like the characters in Rogue One? I, I mean, for me, my favorite has to be like Diogo Luna's character and K2SO. Who's the sassy robot? I <laughs> oh yeah, Alan Tudyk voicing a robot again after I Robot. Twelve years after I Robot. I my favorite characters were K two S O and Chiro in way. Uh, and I think a lot of people were going into this very ready to hate Jin Erso. I think there were a lot of people who were going into this and they were like, okay, I'm gonna crap all over the main character because this character does not fit all of my mental stipulations of what I think the protagonist of a Star Wars film should. So I think the deck was sort of stacked against her, and there were people who were saying she was bland, and people who were saying the character was boring, and I disagree with that completely. I mean, she kind of is, but... That's... I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I think that the backstory that they gave Jin, it is kind of an archetypical, tragic backstory. Uh, and... The things that happen in her past that define her, you've seen it happen to other characters. But what I like about Jin is she's not in neither extreme, right? She's not a damsel in distress, but neither is she Ellen Ripley with with a flamethrower. She has 
her human moments. And there were certainly emotional beats that I thought Felicity Jones played beautifully. And I liked mm-hmm. the father-daughter thread in the middle of it. Uh, there's one flashback to when she was a young girl and, and she sort of sees her father, you know, and, and her mother like having cocktails with Galen. And I liked that moment. And she she's too young to know what's going on yet. And I like that she had to be convinced uh, to join the rebellion. And there's one line where, where she said, where Cassian was like, are you okay with the Empire flying their flag all throughout the galaxy? And said, it's okay so long as you don't look up. And, oh, you know, that that's, it's like, you have to deny yourself so much. You have to, you, you have to, you don't have the luxury of saying, I'm going to take a political stand. You just kind of accept where you are. And then the character develops, evolves. She decides, I'm not going to accept my lot in life. I'm going to fight for what I think is right. And I like that. I like that arc very much. Yeah, but, I mean, like you said, it's an arc that's been done before. And that arc doesn't really interest me. So I guess that's why I didn't really get into a character. I mean, I didn't hate her. I thought she was fine. She was a good plot point. Because she is a plot device. To get characters doing whatever the plot wants them to do. And she's she's the person who instigates everything. And without her, a lot of things can happen in, in the story. So to me, she she's more of a plot device than an actual character. And that's what I got out of her. But for what she is, I'm okay. Like, I prefer Diego Luna's character more because I like his... I like that he is, you know, the dirty part of Star Wars, which is he's the good guy, but he does bad things. To... You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. And um, I think that you can look at a lot of characters in this as plot devices, if if that's how you're going to define them, in insofar as... The whole thing is a quest a movie. You have to get to get from A to B to get C and put C at B. So these characters are going along that journey, it's kind of linear, and uh I kind of disagree that she she's only a plot device. I think that they gave her enough uh dimensions and that Felicity Jones is a good enough actress. That she just doesn't look yeah, like she's there. I was really worried she would have that one face problem. Yeah, because she does in the trailers. So, the trailers only give her one. She only has yeah, one in the trailers, mm, right? Face. Yeah. So I'm really glad that she had a lot. She had a range of emotions. So for that, I'm grateful. Yeah. And oh, did you like? Did you like her relationship with um, Diego Luna's character? I forgot his with name. With Cassian. Yes, Cassian, yes, I love that. I I really like that. Both of them start out not liking each other, but they don't do the overly twee romantic comedy bickering. And yeah. they are both... They... That, that, that was safe for K2SO and Jean, which I really love yes. their relationship. They're, they're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rescue. Congratulations, you are being rescued. Oh, it's great. And I, I like how Alan Tudyk did the delivery where it's kind of stilted. It's almost an English accent, but not. It's unnatural, and yet there's still inflection. Uh, he did everything right, I think, and the design of K2SO is marvellous. How all of the emotion is in the way he cocks his head, in the way the eyes telescope in and out, the irises, you know, sort of uh, going in and out, and oh, it's really, really good. So anyway, the relationship between Cassian and Jin, uh, there's one pivotal moment where they have a big argument. And normally when that happens in movies, I'm like, okay, this is a silly argument. Why are you arguing? Let's get back to whatever it is we're supposed to be doing. But there was a good reason they were having that argument and both sides were compelling and both of them made their point and you could see why both of them were thinking the way they did. So that's what I liked. And yeah, so it's, I guess it's a spoiler to say whether or not it becomes a romantic relationship. So we'll get to that in spoilers. I I, I couldn't tell by the way. Right, yeah. But yeah. never mind. Yeah, we'll get so, to so that in spoilers. Me. We'll talk about that in spoilers. And Well, we have to go through spoilers uh, we have to go to spoilers soon, so... Right, yeah. Uh, so quickly, did you like Darth Vader in this? Yes. Was he shoot in? No. Uh, Shu or, Horn didn't, no. He's really great, right? I really like yeah. him in this too. Very judicious. I think there's a danger of falling back on one of the greatest screen villains ever created. But the scenes that they gave him... He's so badass in this, though. Yes. Everything felt right. All the lines, all the character beats, it felt faithful. Uh, I'm glad we got James Earl Jones back. He doesn't sound... 
uh, that like his age that much at all. In, in fact, I think maybe they did some digital modulation to his voice, but it's great because it doesn't feel like someone cosplaying Darth Vader, which was the fear I had. I, I was afraid that, okay, it will look like a fan film and somebody stuck Darth Vader in. But mm-hmm. the places where he shows up in this story make sense. I'm glad they didn't overuse him. And his interactions with the new characters uh, really, really work. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to spoilers. I mean, first of all, yeah, we recommend this, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And, and definitely a movie experience. And if there's any film you should watch <laughs> by the end of this year, it's definitely Rogue One. Rogue One or Moana? But I think Rogue One is a better film to watch. Yes, Rogue One. I like Rogue One a in, lot. Sorry, in theatres. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, before we go on to spoilers, well, we, we have to talk about Chirrut and Days. So, yeah, those those are the characters that... Uh, Chirrut has some very quotable lines, and I think it's a bit eye-roll worthy that you have a Chinese guy who is playing a martial artist blind warrior monk, but I don't think he's really that stereotypical. I think that the character has a certain depth. And he's fun. Yeah. I think that he's very fun. He's very fun. And the dynamic between Chiru and Days is very sweet. Uh, I like that they are sort of brothers in arms, that they have, you know, that Usia movie sort of blood brothers thing where I'm going to look out for you and you're going to look out for me and we're going to argue and disagree. But at the end of the day, we got each other's back. I thought that was very yeah. heartwarming. And that's something which is key to Star Wars, you know, the brothers in arms sort of relationship. I Yeah, and Jiang Wen, he completely transformed himself. He looks nothing like that in real life. And if you look at him in his other movies, he's a writer, director, and an actor. He doesn't look like he would be a big bruiser in holding the huge gun. But he's so good in this. He's, he's really good. I agree. All right, let's go on to spoilers. Blah, blah, spoilers. Everyone dies. I really liked it. That was I, I, yeah, I'm, spectacular. Oh, it, and, and the death wasn't like, oh, you know, this is meant for to, to bring some emotional... Uh, it's it's just to bring some emotions out of me. It's like no, it makes sense that they all died and they died in a very valiant way, and that's very respectful. Right. Yeah. I love. I I I don't know. I just love the way they showed Jean and Cassin's death. I think I I know it's a cop out to say that the main characters get the best death, even though a lot of people can argue like K two K two SO's death was amazing too. Oh yeah. But oh, I I so love. I I love the visuals of how the light just encapsulates. I can't say that. And gulfs them. And gulfs them, yeah. yeah. And you just see them just. It, it's so sad, but it's so touching and beautiful as well when they're just, you know, hugging each other. Or, ah, well. Yeah. It was a great. It was a great scene because. Uh, okay, you know, when the third act happened, I was kind of annoyed because it felt like Jean and Cassin had. The lesser uh, had had the more had had the safer job because everyone was like out in the battlefield, and they were had a chance of getting shot at while they were just inside that place. Right. At the same time, there were, was the risk of them getting caught. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, but you know, when when immediate danger is there, it you don't really think. Yeah, about they're not it, charging into battle the way that Baze and Chiru and you know all of those other guys were. Yeah. Yeah. So. I guess at the end, it's it's a really sad death, but it's very poignant as well. And I really want to applaud the people behind this film to have the balls to kill off everyone in the main cast. But it never felt like it was undeserved. It's like, of course, everyone had to die. And they died in such a... You know, I like how the pilot... What's his name? Bodhi. Riz Ahmed. Bodhi right? Rukia. Yeah. yeah, like, I love that actor. He's He's so great in Nightcrawler as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love the way I love how he died. Even though it was very convenient that he managed to send that signal up just as he was about to die. But yeah, he he looked I resigned d- to his fate. That's so sad. He was like, "Okay, yeah, this is it, and I'm okay with that." That's so sad. I I loved how he just died. There was no like last speech. No there fanfare. was no like, "Oh, yeah. the force is with me, and I'm with the force," or something like that. You know, he just he just died like that. <laughs> just like how it would be in a war. And I love how you know the other. The one with Itman. Oh yeah, uh, Baze. Uh, no, like, there are other soldiers with them, right, and then yeah. one of them was like, okay, I'm gonna go out now, and he just gets shot and he dies. Melchi and I all thought, those guys, like, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was so brave, and that was so sad that he went out the way he did. And it really, you know, that's that's what war is, right? Like, a bullet can kill a person in such a short amount of time. And I thought, like, the third act, it it wasn't scary like Godzilla scary, but it was 
frightening to think of. Like this is this is a this is a fictional world, but it it evokes so much of the war films that you've seen mm-hmm. and the war footages that you've seen and yeah, it's just it's a scary thought. But I like how all of them died. Yeah, and I think what you're getting at what you're getting at no no not at all. What you're getting at is that there's an emotional resonance which you would not expect from a science fiction fantasy film. Because the setting is so far removed from what we've seen, but yet Gareth was able to lock on to the imagery and the way it's used is not manipulative. I mean there are a lot of movies where I complain about you know buildings are toppling over because they want to remind you of nine eleven. I don't think this movie did that. And at the same time, a lot of people are saying Rogue One is and a necessary movie. We already know what's going to happen. So why make it anyway? So, ta-da, we kill because everyone. When you think about it, when Luke... Lucas. When Luke was complaining about being bored and whatever, this was happening. Exactly, People yeah. People were dying for him. Yeah, my friend had the idea of when the Blu-ray comes out, cutting together Luke whining with the battle in Scarif. And I thought that that was a funny <laughs> idea. Yeah, and there are people who say, oh... Rogue One is not dark enough. Disney kiddified it so much. And I don't understand that at all. I don't understand how someone can say that when all your main characters die. And I think that we... You know what? Sorry, go on. Sorry for interrupting. No, you go, you go ahead. I, I really hate, like, in the comments, people are saying, Oh man, Disney, whatever, they suck. All, all Star Wars movies should be like this. It's, it should all be dark and whatever. But it's like, no! <laughs> Rogue One needed to be dark because this is war that they're fighting in a war. And these people, they don't have as as much resources as, you know, Luke has, which is the freaking force, right? Yes. And I love Rogue One, the dark tone worked because it is a dark issue. It's a scary issue. And it is war. So I don't want all Star Wars films to be like this. Yeah, I just want to say that. I'm sorry. Go on. No, that's okay. And I completely agree. I think when people do that, you need to go back and understand the origins of Star Wars. Why did Star Wars exist? What was it trying to evoke? What were the main sources of inspiration? You have mythology, you have the Greek myths, you have the Odyssey, you have King Arthur, but you also have Flash Gordon. You also have the serials, kind of campy, silly sci-fi space adventures of the 30s and 40s pulp comic books. You have all of those influences. So the big element of Star Wars really is escapism. It's supposed to be something fun. It's supposed to be fantasy to capture the imagination and to bring you to to new exciting worlds. You meet characters that you can relate to. You meet villains whom you want to root against and hate and you have... Unless you're Darth Vader. Yeah, which in that case you love him. Uh, and, and you want to see him kill more people. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and. In amazing ways. Oh, it's such a good scene. Yeah, but so the core of Star Wars is not about being dark and gritty. Dark and gritty is a flavor that can be applied where it's appropriate. So yeah, I think that the tone of The Force Awakens is spectacular. I feel the humor in The Force Awakens is just right. I think the lines sound like things people would say. The visual gags, the design of BB-8 and the stuff BB-8 does, I think was very much in line with what we've established to, uh, in the original trilogy. And it was not the kind of humor in the prequels, which is really forced and uncomfortable. And you're like, I think this is offensive to certain groups of people. <laughs> this is like all of a sudden, you have, that's definitely a stereotype of like a black and white minstrel mm-hmm. show. Yeah? And oh, th- these are Asian, like greedy Asian people. We're talking about trade and cowards and all of that, and they have sticky eyes and so yeah, that that doesn't there isn't anything that in Force Awakens and there isn't anything like that in Rogue One. Uh yeah. By the way, I I I should have said they mentioned hope like a thousand times in this film. I swear, especially like near the end. All right, here's why. Do you feel that? No, here's. They say hope a lot. I love because that. you know a new hope. I hope. I love that. You know why? Because why? this has such a bleak ending. So. When when they say hope, when when people keep on saying hope, when they say rebellions are built on hope, in fact, that was kind of sarcastic. Was when when the first time you hear rebellions are built on hope, it was kind of like Cassian and Jin Erso were being sarcastic to each other, and so you are conditioned to expect there to be a triumphant ending that in the end hope wins. Nope, everyone dies. So I like that. I think that it and 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 episode four is a new hope. 
So I, I, I like how that was used. I like that. It was supposed to be kind of cheesy way, like, oh, all right, yeah, you're telling us that it's all going to be okay. No, it's not. Did you, <laughs> did you did you expect all of them to die? I mean, to be fair, no, like I no, was, I didn't expect I wasn't all of them expecting to die. all of them to die. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Oh yay! Because because Lucas expected all of them to die because he's like, well, they all died <laughs> in, in in the opening crawl, so they all have to die now. Well, I, I don't. Rebel Spice freak out. I don't think it says the Rebel Spice died in the opening crawl. In fact, the opening crawl says that it was a victory for the rebels. It was the rebels had oh, scored well, the first victory. Well, whoever, in whoever he saw it, he's like they all died anyway. Where, where did you learn that they all died? By the way, where where did was I? Was it like a comic or something? I don't know. Maybe it's because they said it's not going to be a rope two. Maybe, maybe oh well, he didn't follow any news. So like he told me that all of them died, and I couldn't tell whether that was a spoiler or not because I'm like, right, yeah. I, I was kind of with with the internet, which is like, oh, this is Disney; they won't do that. Yeah, and yeah, me did. too. Yeah, I I thought that they would kill uh they they would kill a bunch of not so important characters, and they they would maybe kill Cassian. I thought they would kill Cassian. I didn't think they would kill yeah. Jin. And okay, my favorite death in the film is Awesome Krennic because he is hoist by his own petard. He is killed by the very thing he has been this whole time hankering for the control of. And it was so poetic and so beautiful and such a moment of vindication when he finally is killed directly by a beam from the Death Star. I thought that was very clever. And Ben Mendelsohn's performance in this is great. He's my favourite villain yeah, of 2016. Fantastic. Best villain of 2016, oh. far and away, yeah. Ooh, I can't tell what my best villain is. I guess, I guess memories in Kimi no Nawa. <laughs> that doesn't count. It has to be tangible, physical human. Um, no, yeah, yeah. Okay. How how about um? Did you like the Tarkin or the or the Princess Leia CGI? I thought it was sh- kind of shit. I didn't like it. But yeah, uh, I, I know a lot of people who like just it. recast. Yeah. Okay. So there are certain reasons they did that, and there's certain reasons that ILM felt they were confident enough to use the technology. I can see why people thought. It would be a good idea, but I don't think it's ready for prime time. I think that what happens in doing this is that they overcompensate. There's so many micro mm-hmm. expressions going on with Tarkin that Peter Cushing does not do. Peter yeah. Cushing is is much more still as an actor, and they were in trying to make it more lifelike, they make it more unnatural, and it's smack down in the middle of the uncanny valley. It, it it's not it's not and it's very animated. Yeah, yeah. Like, it it looks like was... he's in a cutscene of a video game. Yeah, yeah. If this was in a video game, I can assure you, like, I would be praising it like crazy because everyone looks... else would look like that. Everyone else would have yeah. that same look. Yeah. And it's like it's gonna be a very expensive video game, but it looks amazing in a video game. Sure. And yeah. I love as an animator, I think like the little nuances in his like his eye, his little eye shifts, his little like eyebrow twitch, like all those are just amazing. But then you can tell it's animated, and. Especially, I think he's been he's in the film for quite some time, right? Yeah, and yeah. he's interacting with real life people. Yeah, so you're cutting so you back really... and forth from real faces to a CG face, and it's not yeah, yeah. working. So, yeah, yeah, and so you can tell that it's not real. And then Princess Leia, her, her eyes were like huge. Yeah, yeah, and then her mouth moves, and it's like it's it looks like it's about to unhinge, like <laughs> her mouth is about to open up and then swallow somebody whole. <laughs> no, at, like, at the same time. I, this wasn't a deal breaker for me at all. I don't think it crippled the film or hurt it beyond redemption. It's just something which I thought could have been done better. But I understand why they did it, and I'm okay with it not being as good as it could have been. Yeah, I mean, animation is hard. Yeah, yeah. And real life animation is even worse. And real life animation with people beside it as reference is just nightmare for any animator ever. So. All I can say is that's amazing animation, but don't don't do what you did, you know. Yeah, when, I, I think when obviously the technology isn't ready yet. No, I think they bit off more than they could chew. And there there is an article. I think it's Hollywood Reporter of its variety, and the headline is why the Rogue One's digital Tarkin is a game changer. And the horrifying implication is that people are going to do this to Audrey Hepburn, to Marlon Brando, to Marilyn Monroe. This is going to resurrect dead movie stars really nearly which I think is a terrible, stupid idea. And the reason they did it in Rogue One is because it's a prequel, it's set during the time, and, you know, Peter Cushing is an iconic performance. And whoever did the voice, which is still not telling us who did the voice... It's amazing. That's I, nuts. I really it. It's so good. 
so good when you know you may file when ready and that's it's so and close it's so close and the superstitiousness and the shouting match he has with Krennic I, I liked it very much and he was like, we are standing up it's my achievement <laughs> and yeah I, I kind of like um, with the characterization of Krennic how he was supercilious and he was cold and he fits your expectation of an imperial higher up but he's also insecure He's also eager mm-hmm. for validation. He also needs yeah, to yeah. have the approval of Tarkin of Vader of the Emperor. I like that very much. I think that that was that fit, and it felt like this is that kind of movie where you need that kind of villain. I think that like the relationship between him. There's a hierarchy, basically. Yes, that's right. And I uh, I've started reading a friend gave me as a Christmas present the prequel novel Catalyst, which is about oh. Galen and uh, Orson Krennic's relationship. And it, is it a, a novel or is it a comic It's book? a novel. So it's, yeah, it's, okay. it details like the building of the Death Star. And it's very technical. They, they go into a lot of facts and figures and they sort of show... I've, I'm, I've only just started it, but from what I understand, it's about Galen and Awesome Krennic. How did you like the music in this? Mm, okay, that's a good question. So Michael Giacchino was a last-minute replacement for Alexandra Desplat, who was going to do this and then... They did the re-editing and the reshoots and his schedule made him unavailable. I like the music a lot. I think that following John Williams is the world's toughest act, especially when you have themes that are as iconic as those in Star Wars. And uh, I know my brother, a lot of people did not like the main theme, which goes dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, which I, I like liked it. a lot. That made me really, really happy. And my brother says that it reminds him of the sort of knockoff versions of themes you hear in How It Should Have Ended. <laughs> oh. when they can't use oh, yeah, the real true. music so they shift tonally by a few keys and it's on purpose but those are nice yeah those are I like those, those. Are nice. and, and I think uh, why some people don't like it is because they feel that it makes it sound like it's a knockoff but I like that I like that it subverted our expectations in the same way the movie does because you expect a certain thing out of Star Wars it gives you something similar enough that you recognise it but it is a, there's a pleasant surprise and I thought that that was um, that was inherent in the score and they also developed that theme that you hear in episode 4 because in episode 4 the Imperial March hasn't been composed yet so when Vader walks into the tentative floor it goes dun, 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 and it's kind of like an ominous Imperial theme and they expand that out so Michael Giacchino did a whole thing around that which wow. I like yeah for I didn't even notice that Austin Krennic has a nice theme when, when he's flying in on the shuttle at first and how tense and ominous that is I like that very much I think the music in this is great Okay, that's great. I mean, I I liked it for what it was. But I I think the reason, well, what for me, Star Wars. I feel like a lot of a lot of the themes match with the characters. So like, Darth Vader has the Imperial March, and then you know, Princess Leia's theme is that beautiful score that you always hear in the trailers. Yeah, yeah. And I I think that's what this film is missing, like its own identity or. A character song, right? I, I, I understand that. Yeah, that makes sense. I yeah, I mean, yes. for me, the the theme I will associate with Rogue One is dun 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 dun. dun. Yeah, but I I, like I can't remember if Cassian had a theme. I can't remember if Jin had a theme. So yeah, 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 and um, that's that's right. Yeah, I I mean, my favorite piece of music from the whole saga is Luke and Leia, just da 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 da. Da 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 da. I'm sorry, I don't recognize that. It's uh, you hear it in in episode six, and it's. Oh, it's so beautiful. I think it really captures the the sort of the dynamic of relationship that is not romantic, that is a sibling relationship and it has that somberness to it, but it's also very gentle. So I, I love Luke and Leia, the, the, the theme. Please send me the link. Okay, I shall do that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, I, I, I trust you. <laughs> Thank you. Freaking John Williams. Yeah, it's John You know Williams. what? I'll, I'll be honest, like a lot of John Williams theme, they all blend. Right, yeah. So yeah because he's... I, I, He's referencing the golden age, you know, Eric Congold. It's sort of very lush, uh, romantic era sort of score. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's why I I really like the new Fantastic Beast theme because it all right it feels yeah. like Harry Potter, but it doesn't feel very John Williamsy. Yes, yes. Which I can't tell whether that's a good or bad thing, but it does distinguish, you know, both the scores. Yeah. Dun, da, da, dun, da, da, dun, dun, da, 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 da. I still remember that, so that's a good sign. <laughs> um. Okay. So, anything else you want to say about this film? Yeah, there's probably a lot of stuff that I want to say that uh, will occur to me much later after after we're finished recording the podcast and the glow. Oh no, I forgot something. Um. 
uh, I I really like Bogalat, so he's become kind of a little meme that that I will go that I I Bogalat? yeah Bogalat is the squid of truth that interrogates oh. yeah. Oh, that hentai character. Do you know what hentai is? <laughs> yes, I know what hentai is. Okay. Yes, Jerry. So, no, I, I like to imagine that there was some sort that... I mean, I would love someone to draw a cute prequel webcomic where Saw Gerrera is like holding a tiny squid in his hand. He's like, I will raise you as my own child. And the squid goes... like that voice? <laughs> was he supposed to sound like that? Yeah. Because I heard like he was in, in the animated series as well. Yes. He, this is, that's fun. I like that he was a character in the animated series. The animated series is a young man. So this is years later, and he's supposed to be kind of a mirror image to Darth Vader, where he's a cyborg, and he's had so much uh, battle damage, and and like parts of him have been lost to the war. So he has to breathe. He has that uh, that 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 mask to breathe, and he has cyborg legs. So I think the hoarse, like stretched out voice is that he's very near to the end of his life. Okay. Yeah, it, it's sometimes a little bit silly. Like, it was, lies! Deceptions! <laughs> that, that's a little bit silly. But I like that Forrest Whitaker is playing not a usual Forrest Whitaker character. Forrest Whitaker is usually kind of neat in his movies. And and then the one he won an Oscar for is when he was playing Idi Amin, the, you know, the, the crazy dictator of Uganda. Yeah. Oh, he was so good in The Butler, by the way. Oh, yeah, I'm really yeah. sad he didn't get a nomination. I thought he was great in The Butler. He was very sympathetic. And I think he was very convincing across the different ages. Because you see that character as a young man, you see him as an old man, and, and see him with makeup. I thought he was quite convincing. So. Yeah. Um, I really love how they, they talked about a plot hole in episode 4, which is why, why was there such an easy way yeah. to get rid of the Death Star? I love the reason why they put it in this film. Brilliant, brilliant. It, it, yeah. it never felt contrived. No. It's like, oh, that's kind of sweet. It is, yeah. And the whole thing where he calls he, his nickname for her is Stardust. Stardust. You know, and oh, so sad. And uh, oh, this is the second consecutive Star Wars film to end with a Skywalker sibling removing his or her hood and turning around the camera. <laughs> Except that Leia has lines and Luke doesn't. I thought that was funny and I don't know whether it's intentional or not. And if you think about it, this movie begins with a father-daughter scene, and so does episode 4. Yeah. Which is, yeah, but in a very different context. And yeah. yeah. The, the whole you thing know, with... after one father is done killing... Yeah. Oh, can we can we talk about that scene where he uses that lightsaber? Yes. He just comes in and just starts like the The fan everyone. service badassery, where he's going through the corridors, like, like making mincemeat out of all the rebel soldiers. It's brilliant. Like when when I saw that because I I saw Star Wars like in my late teens, right? Yeah. So to me, when I saw the battles for the first time, I'm like, this this isn't very impressive. Like as a, I watched Episode Four, right? Sure, yeah. And then From 1977. it was the fight between Obi Wan and and Darth Vader, yeah, the, And I was like, and an old man kind of fighting weird. a half, yeah, yeah. yeah. Human. <laughs> so, so so when I saw this scene, I'm like. Oh, okay, that's what kids saw when they were younger. Like, this really yeah, badass yeah. guy just coming in and slashing everyone without any remorse. And I love how everyone just sacrificed. And, like, a lot of them didn't want to be killed, obviously. No, yeah. But, you know, they kind of gave up and they just said, hey, just take this, just take this, run away. That was so go, tragic, yeah. Go send these plans. Yeah. Like, it's so sad, but I loved... Like, even I was panicking, even though I knew all of them were dead. Exactly. Like, he yeah. is so frightening in that one scene. Oh, it's great. And, I mean, the galaxy would really have been saved with Dropbox or WeTransfer. So, that <laughs> that would have saved a lot of lives. Yeah, I think... Mean, Cloud. Cloud. Cloud is good for that. Exactly, yeah. When, when he walks in, and then... In that moment, I realized that we're going to dovetail straight into A New Hope. And when I realized that, I was so thrilled. I was like, this couldn't get any better. And and he's standing there, like, overlooking the hole underneath the uh, the, the frigate where the Rebel Blockade Runner has left. And he's looking out. And you know that the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to see inside that ship. You're going to see Leia and you're going to see all of them. And and then it's going to begin episode 4 with the Tante 4, you know, being chased down by the Star Destroyer. Uh, my single favorite part of the film is at the end of the Scarif battle, when they're all doing the hyperspace jump, and just before Admiral Radus is going to jump the hyperspace, the Devastator appears and destroys his ship. So General mm-hmm. Radus has like one or two seconds where he gets to radish the victory at Scarif, which he orchestrated, and then he dies. And it was like, that's really brutal. 
it's such a cruel thing to do, but that's what war is like. So I was that to me was really an impactful death, almost as much as everybody else is almost as much as you know even K two S O on the floor of his eye, like blinking out. That that was like a kick in the ribs is how my friend described it when boom you know out of nowhere like oh that all that was for nothing for Admiral Radis. <laughs> yeah, well. ah, such yeah, a good so movie. I won't watch it again. It I've seen it three film. times. I won't watch it again. What? Yeah, I've seen it three times. I've only seen it once. I saw it once. No wonder you know so much. Uh, I saw it once at at the preview with my brother, and then I saw it the second time with my best friend, and then I saw it the third time with my family, like on my dad's birthday or around my dad's birthday. But I think it was very cold in the theater, so I don't think he really enjoyed yeah. it. <laughs> my my mom didn't really enjoy it, and I had to explain a lot of stuff. <laughs> is she a Star Wars fan? Uh, not really, but she loves the character of Yoda. Yoda is, is oh a okay. Character, yeah. Well, she he is in the film. Did she like Episode One? Yoda wasn't that. <laughs> I I don't think I think she has a stronger memory of the prequels because because that was when I got into it. So she knows Natalie Portman is Padme. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and and I think she likes BB-8 as well. Uh, BBA is amazing. Yeah, BBA is great. BBA or K2SO? Um, I'm going with BBA because I think BBA, he has a harder task, which is follow R2D2. And K2SO uh. is kind of like, you have not seen this role of droid before where he's snarky, but he's also a badass. So that has, you. I mean, you've seen that in the cartoons uh, and in the expanded universe, but not in the main line of the film. So I do want to do like a toy photo where K two S O is kicking BB eight like a football. <laughs> oh. BB eight is like protesting. <laughs> hmm. I think I'll choose. Oh, I love both. Yeah, it's a difficult choice, right? You know what? Screw it. Because you chose BB eight, I'm gonna choose K two S O. Yep. Because sassy, he's so sassy. I love him. Oh yeah, it's and and I I love the he's bit. He's so sweet. He is. He can't lie. Which is adorable. It's like I am taking these prisoners to imprison them in prison. <laughs> oh, and 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 when he's like, you know, you know what the chances are of her using that blaster against you? High, very high. <laughs> and the timing and the way they animate his hands and like the handoff between a physical K two S O and the CG K two S O is really really good. Like the character animation when he's walking around, he looks like he's there. I I love the part where um Jane Jean Urso hit one of the K two S O. I don't know what they're called. Did you know that? And then you're like, oh my god! <laughs> and it's like, oh okay, that's really great. I love that. Oh yeah, and and of course, like, are you kidding me? I am blind. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting it to be that funny, and and I think that all the humor did not <laughs> undermine the intensity of the action, which I find very admirable because. The first thing I will that will pull me out of a movie is if you can't handle your tone, if you can't balance your tone, and I think that this balanced tone very well. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. It was serious when it needed to be serious, and it was funny during the less intense scenes. Right. Yeah. So that's that's great. All right, let's talk about things now. Yeah, so many trailers. I, <laughs> yeah, a lot of trailers. I only put one though. Okay. Because I feel like only one really mattered, which was the Spider Man trailer. Oh wow! It's been that long. Since we've done the show. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I hope so, unless I put this and we already talked about this. No, I don't no, think we, we did. haven't, yeah, we haven't talked about Homecoming yet. Did you like it? Yeah, sure, I did. I, I really like Tom Holland in Civil War. He's very close to what I imagine in my head of Spider Man uh, at a high school age. And I, I think that there's a bit of a danger that it might come off like a Disney Channel or a Nickelodeon sitcom. Uh, that's what I thought when I first saw this right yeah because of all the high school stuff and like oh you know you're looking at the girl walking down the hallway in slow motion and you're chilling out with your best friend and you're like oh you know she's never gonna notice me that kind of stuff but at the same time that kind of stuff is integral to the maples of Spider-Man and I'm very very happy that we we have confirmed that Michael Keaton is the vulture I think the character design of the vulture is superb Uh, I'm, I'm happy with that little fur collar he has going on that evokes but it's not a literal interpretation of the Vulture's look in the comics. And I don't think there'll be a lot of Iron Man. I think they're just doing that to sell the movie, which is kind of weird. Why so people are not going to watch it, and they're going to watch it if Iron Man is in the trailer? Okay. <laughs> it's kind of sad, right? I know, right? I mean, yeah. when when Iron Man is needed to sell the Spider-Man exactly. movie... Exactly, Spider-Man is a much, much bigger, uh, more popular character in terms of like longevity and and 
before the Iron Man movie came out, there were the Spider Man movies. So we have not confirmed that Zendaya is Mary Jane, but it looks like what they're doing. I don't know. Uh, and and Gori Rice is not in this trailer. I'm hoping she's Gwen. She's the daughter of Ryan Gosling in The Nice Guys. So she's been cast mm. in this. Yeah, she's not in the trailer. I, I like that his best friend is not white. <laughs> and is uh, I like that it's a Filipino guy. And I'm, I mean, yay, you know. There's an Asian dude in the movie. It's cool. Uh, and it was, I, I, my heart sort of broke when he dropped the Death Star. <laughs> when he realized that Peter Parker was Spider Man, he was holding the Death Star, and he, the Lego Death Star, and he dropped it on the floor. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think when, when what was that? No, he was, Peter Parker was craw- crawling on the on the ceiling while his friend was in the room, and his friend was so stunned that Ned was so stunned that oh, he dropped. I didn't even notice that. I've only watched the trailer once. He was holding a Death Star made of Lego, and he was like, "Dude, the oh. Spider Man!" And then he dropped it on the floor. And uh, yeah, I think earlier this year we were saying that all of the um all of the comic book movies have Star Wars references this year, and we were saying mm-hmm. except Batman v Superman, and I realized Batman v Superman did have a Star Wars reference. Um, the the prisoner number on Lex Luthor's uniform is TK four two one, who is a stormtrooper who was not at his post in episode. Oh, 20, yeah. okay. So I, I I don't remember if Suicide Squad and Doctor Strange have Star Wars references, but we'll have to go back. <laughs> okay. Well, for me, I I saw the trailer and was like, okay, a new Spider Man film is coming out. I, like like I said, it it really reminded more. It re- it reminded me more of the Disney Channel sit, Disney Channel original movies where yeah, hopefully with better writing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we had. Have you seen Sky High? Yeah, it sort of reminded me of that a little bit. Yeah, I, I... hopefully it's just as fun. I liked Sky High a lot. I liked Kurt Russell yeah, in it. I liked Linda Carter in it. And I, I thought that Danielle Pennebaker was not a bad villain. Um, Danielle Pennebaker wasn't the villain. What? She she was the girlfriend. No, she was right? the girlfriend. Sorry. I like her yeah, a lot. Yeah, okay, sorry. Her. Yeah, so anyway, Spider-Man. It looks okay. Yeah, I mean, I like the bit in Washington, D.C. I like that they're pulling him out of New York for some reason. Hopefully not for too much. But it has the standard stuff that we come to expect of a Spider-Man movie. It has the high school stuff, and it also has him trying to save civilians in danger on a New York mode of transportation. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the the part where like he was pulling the ship. Yeah, the right? ferry. The Is two that supposed ferry. to evoke Spider-Man too? I think it's just the a, one with the train. Yeah, I think it's just a thing he does in the comics. I think there's a lot of him. Oh, but, yeah. okay, sorry. No, no, it it probably is. Uh, it was it was kind of funny. We had there was this meme going around where it was. Toby Maguire Spider Man in the front of the train. Oh yeah, yes. help me! Uh, watching help me, Tom. Andrew... And then Tom Holland is just posing next to the train, and then Andrew Garfield is inside the train, crawling on the ceiling, going, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> just kind I, of. I I saw this video of like Toby Maguire watching Andrew Garfield watching the Spider Man train. <laughs> I have not seen that yet. I need to go find that. That sounds funny. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's um. It's really sad. I really like Andrew Garfield as Spider Man. Not much as Peter Parker because he's he was way too hot for Peter Parker, but I I, I liked him as well. Yeah. Uh do you wanna move on to, to another trailer because there's so many? What other trailers do you wanna talk about? Um there was the mummy trailer, which Yeah, what whatever I guess. It's yeah, it's the mummy, uh the scream. Yeah. Best ride in Universal Studios. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. I, I like the Transformers ride a little bit better. So that segues into Transformers The Last Night. Uh, which... Oh, I haven't seen that. Oh, I'm like, fuck okay. Transformers. I understand that sentiment and I'm with you. And uh, it gives me great, great sadness to hear Sir Anthony Hopkins say the words Optimus and Prime. But that's what <laughs> happens. Yeah. British well, actors like money. Maybe. Yeah. Think about it. Think about it. Maybe he's talking about in the cartoon. Just think about the good one. <laughs> British actors like money. And at the same time, we all have to remember that Orson Welles voiced you in Micron. So there's precedence for this sort of like prestigious involvement in Transformers uh, franchise. Okay, so the thing I want to say is that this movie is going to have King Arthur and it's going to have Nazis. So I... L- oh, please. It's only going to be for like two minutes. Yes. So that's what I want to talk about is that I really love that one tiny minuscule aspect of this live action franchise, which is the alternate history conspiracy theory element. The whole thing of the Hoover Dam was built to hide the Allspark. Fantastic. 
there's some sort of portal generator in the pyramids of Giza. That's fun. Or the moon mission, Apollo 11, was all a cover-up by the US government to investigate an alien crash. Awesome. None of that is the focus. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's what frustrates me to know when, because I feel like a brilliant story could be told from that germ of I'll be honest, when you said those words, I'm just like, what? That that happened in the film? Right, yeah. (laughs) And my brother had a suggestion of, you know, the Industrial Revolution happened because Autobots, and you have like Uh. a steampunk kind of Transformer walking around. That'd be awesome. That's amazing though. Cool, yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? No, they're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. They're going to focus on like Mark Warburg running around with a 12-year-old girl and who's, who's going to... Is she in it again? It's a new, the, the, new 12-year-old girl. The model? Uh, what? New, new 12-year-old girl. There's a new it's one. It's a new girl now? Yeah, uh, Isabella oh. Mona, who's literally 12, I think. Like, yeah, she's she's a Nickelodeon actress or a Disney Channel actress. Okay. Yeah, and she plays like this plucky orphan. Which is, oh my gosh, please stop. Um, yeah, so Transformers last night, and then we had Blade Runner 2049, which looks very promising. Danny Villeneuve doing sci-fi. I haven't seen that yet. I, I want to try to avoid anything about that sure, film, but okay. I won't. I won't tell you anything about it's that. it's probably going to show in the theaters mm-hmm. anyway, so... And then we had the trailer for Alien Covenant. Uh, haven't seen that yet. Don't want to know anything about brand it. Brand new. Um, that's, that looks good. Uh, and then we have... I know it came out... During Christmas, yes, so I haven't yes, seen it. Yes, just yesterday. And then we have War for the Planet of the Apes. Have you seen that one? I, I don't want to see that. All right. I don't want to see okay. anything. Like, the, the films I'm interested in, I I haven't seen the trailers. Right, yeah. Unless it's like this really big, huge, dumb blockbuster. Well, not dumb, like but the mummy? A, a huge blockbuster <laughs> film. I would want to watch it. But something like Aliens, Planet, I think those are blockbusters, but they're not like comic book blockbuster films. Yeah, I think so that they, I, they have kind of a lineage. I think they have... Yeah. I mean, to be... I, I don't want to sound super condescending towards comic book films because I do think that they're pretty good. Sure, yeah. But I think I think Aliens and, and Planet of the Apes, they have more story elements to it that I probably don't want to see coming. Sure, I, I understand that, yeah. At, at the same time, both franchises have had really silly entries in their canon. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I was just watching all of the special features for Alien Resurrection. And that movie is kind of an interesting mess because a lot of it doesn't work, but it's written by Joss Whedon. And you can see the seeds of Firefly being planted there. A lot of the characters are very similar to his crew in Firefly. So I enjoy it on that basis. Directed by... To be fair, to be fair, um, the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, I think he wrote Scooby-Doo too. Yeah, and he, he it was involved in Movie 43. I actually asked James Gunn a Movie 43 related question. Oh, well, that was brave of Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I asked him uh, <laughs> what would happen if Beazle, um, the cat from Movie 43, met Rocket Raccoon. And then he just like, laughed nervously and said that it would be weird because one is 2D animated and one is CGI. And then he just moved on. <laughs> so that was fun. That was really brave of you, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I felt like I weirdly came off as antagonistic towards James Gunn in that interview, but I don't think he was very mad. <laughs> Uh, so any other trailers you want to talk about that hopefully I've seen? Um, wait, let I need to pull up my list of movies coming out in... Oh, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Did you see that trailer? Nope. Yeah, that's the one with Cara Delevingne and Dane DeHaan, Fifth Element thing. Uh, yeah, it, it those two actors don't look like they work in that movie, but that movie itself looks like it could be fun because it's, direct, it's uh, directed by Luc Besson and it's adapted from this French... Uh, sci-fi comic called Valerian and Laura Ling, which is very, very influential and some people say inspired stuff like Star Wars. This sort of like space opera adventure and it looks like it could be entertaining but it also looks too cartoonish. Like the mm-hmm. CGI, all of it looks like it's... it's uh, Jupiter Ascending? A little bit. It looks like it could be Jupiter Ascending but with more of a more of an adventure emphasis instead of a instead of a soap opera emphasis and Jupiter Ascending was very much a soap opera at the same time I do not hate Jupiter Ascending like I've said before <laughs> I thought it was I, I mean I, I recognize how silly it is but I like the design and certain aspects of it and I think that it's not a, an unmitigated train wreck a train wreck I think it's a little bit so bad it's good uh, yeah yep I, I'll, I'll watch it one day I promise you it's it's um, reasonably fun uh, All right. You, wait. Hang you on. know what? I saw you freaking out over this, so I'm. I really want to see your. I really want to hear your thoughts on it. Gotham City Sirens. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm very, very excited for the idea of Gone City Sirens film because you have these three characters. You have Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and Harley Quinn. So our first piece of bad news is that Megan Fox is being looked at for Poison Ivy. And the reason people came to this conclusion is that Megan Fox's office at Warner Brothers ordered two issues of the Terry Dotson Carl Castle run on Harley Quinn. And these two issues were about Harley Quinn hanging out with Poison Ivy. So people mm-hmm. were very alarmed. But it's not written in stone yet. Okay, so this is being directed by David Ayer, but it's being written by G- Geneva Robertson Duarte, who is also writing the Tomb Raider movie. So I don't think she has produced feature credits, but I think she might have TV stuff. So, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that there are more female writers doing genre stuff. I want that. I want there to be action movies written by women, and it doesn't matter that a woman has written them, you know? So... Yeah, I'm I'm glad that and this is being produced by Margot Robbie. So she's using her clout and I like that it's a Gotham City Sirens film because if she were a complete egotist, she would say, I want the movie to be all about Harley Quinn and just Harley Quinn. Yeah. And I'm glad that it's gonna be about the three of them. And I'm hoping that the characterizations are relatively faithful because as it stands, Harley is maybe a little bit over sexualized in the DCU because she is sexy and she does use her wiles to get her way, but She's the ditz, you know, she's the goofball. And it's Catwoman and Poison Ivy who are supposed to be the classically vampy sex symbols. Uh, could you explain what Gotham City Sirens is? Because I've never heard of it. Yeah, Gotham City Sirens is the name that we use to refer to Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and Harley Quinn together. So it's it's supposed to be kind of a Thelma and Louise thing where it's these three women just go on adventures and... Uh, tr- in Gotham City, and then they run into various villains. Uh, I think at one point of time, they converted Riddler to be a good guy. So, there's, oh. yeah, they, they have different adventures, and part of it is, I hope part of it is like a roommate sitcom, where it's just the three of them trying to coexist and get along, and that's when it's funniest. So the I feel like they need a comedy director for this, and not David Ayer. Because I love David Ayer, but he... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like we need a situation where it's somebody like the Russo brothers who are doing Gotham City Sirens, like a female Russo brothers. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't have to be a female director, but I think that helps. I think it would be nice if you have a woman directing this who has lived with other women and can draw on the experience of... It's, it, it would be funny if you have the mundanity of you're using the wrong toothbrush up against she has immunity to all toxins. And this is the world's greatest super thief. I think that would be funny. Uh, the, the, because the three of them fight a lot. And it's mostly mm-hmm. Poison Ivy just being exasperated at what an idiot Harley is sometimes. And Catwoman couldn't care less. She's in the corner like filing her nails. So I think that that dynamic could be really fun. And I want there to be yeah. animals. I want there to be cats and the hyenas. I just, I just want this to be like the cartoon. I want this to be like Batman the Animated Series. Because that's where it originated from. The idea of putting the three of them together. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and, and oh, I... it sounds very fun. I like the... I uh, hope it's well. I kind of like the romantic pairing of Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn. I like that maybe they're not just friends. I think that, that that is something that could be explored, where it's like, you know, Poison Ivy cares more about you than the Joker does. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I'm sure that... I mean, seeing how PC they are trying to be now, I think that they might do that. And I hope they do, because I, I really love the relationship between Harley and... And poison ivy. It's it's very cute. It is, yeah, know. and it's sweet. I I I mean, at the same time, there is a very real danger that it might seem exploitative. Like, oh, it's just because people think that girl on girl is hot, and that's the only reason you're doing that. So I hope, <laughs> I mean, that that will probably be what happens. But I hope they maintain the sweetness of it and the sort of like the the friendship that is that is there, in as much as there might be a romantic relationship going on. Does that make yeah. sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. Honestly, have you heard of this new anime called Yuri on Ice? Everyone's <laughs> talking about Yuri on Ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I haven't seen it yet, but I think it should be like that. Like, it's a very healthy relationship. They don't emphasize that, oh, these are two guys that love each other. It's more like they respect one another. And, you know, because because of that, they, they sort of fell for each other. And I hope... They build on the friendship first before it's like, oh, I just want to have sex with a girl. I totally to agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't want it to be I kissed a girl and I liked it. Which is, yeah. 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 I, I think that 
what would be fun is if on the surface it looks like a frivolous, shallow, silly movie, but then the themes it gets into are actually kind of mature and it's almost kind of an insightful look at what it's like uh, being in relationship with another woman, be it in a romantic context or a platonic context, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I also want lots of cool female villains. Yeah, I, I would like <laughs> Volcana to show up and Livewire and people like that. So that'll be fun. Okay, so Patrick Wilson. Yes, I, I really love him, by the way. Mm. Patrick Wilson Raul. will join Aquaman as Ocean Master. Oh gosh, really? Oh cool. I, I This is the first I've heard of it, actually. Yeah. That's neat. I, I like it. I love this casting. Although he's not as big. But yeah, I mean, Ocean Master, he's like... The brother of yeah, it's of Aquaman, it's Thor right? and Loki. It's exactly Thor and Loki. Except except this time Loki wins. Yeah, Orn right? Orn and uh, Orn and Arthur. And in the Aquaman animated film, uh, which was set within the New Fifty Two context, I think they were trying to actually even get the character design close to Loki. So that was oh. yeah, it was kind of intentional. Where he had the darker hair and was a slimmer build, and a little bit Asian looking when they designed him and. Uh, Aquaman is big and strapping and is a blonde surfer team, so yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this mainly because I like the actor. He's he's fantastic in um The Conjuring 2. Yeah, I think he's one of those guys where you look at him and you go, maybe you are a bit bland, but in the right context, he's he can... He's good. Yeah. I, I mean, I've only seen him in Watchmen and The Conjuring. Phantom and, of the Opera? Um, I... I I try to skip that. <laughs> the one with Gerard Butler, Yes, he's right? Raul. No. And he's actually a really good Raul because Raul was really? mostly handsome and kind of bland. And he's that. I think he's the best singer Wait. of the three of them. Of Emmy Rossum. What? Yeah, of Emmy Wait, Rossum. Of, uh, as in Patrick Wilson? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought you were talking about Gerard Butler. I'm like, no, no, no. I've no, heard no. him sing Phantom of the Opera. No, Gerard Butler cannot Don't sing. Lie to no, me. no. Uh, and because Patrick Wilson was a stage musical actor. Yeah. yeah, so he came from that background. And I think at one point in time he was going to be an Ant-Man and he dropped out. I just like that. I, I Who's the guy who's, um, who does, who does, uh, oh, crap, I forgot, Watchmen. The the really cool guy. Rorschach? Rorschach, yeah. I hope the actor gets a job in the new DC. Yes, so. I want all of the Watchmen to be in the DCEU because we already have so far Patrick Wilson, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Who else is in the DCEU from Watchmen? Uh, Billy Crudup is playing Flash's dad, Barry Allen's dad. Yeah, Dr. Manhattan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's all. Yeah, I... I mean, of the main five. I mean, you know what? I really, really wanted Carla Gugino, the Silk Spectre, Silk Spectre's mom, to be Martha Wayne. I think that would have been much better if if it were her, and yeah, if it were the comedian and Silk Spectre who were Batman's parents, I think that would have been great. Because, uh, that yeah. Would have been, I think that would have taken people out of the really? movie, Really? Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. <laughs> I like this casting. I hope the Aquaman movie is good. I like James Me Wan. too, oh, yeah. I just realized that that's the reason why Patrick Wilson is in this. That's right, probably. because of the Conjuring connection. Yeah, good catch. Yeah. Oh, another trailer we have to talk about, The Fate of the Furious. I know you don't like this franchise, but that trailer looks fun. I, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I do know that someone goes broke, right? Yeah, Vin Diesel like sort of throws in with Charlie Theron and betrays his whole gang, and he's like, I'm with Charlie Theron now. And he like kisses <laughs> Charlie Theron in front of Michelle Rodriguez to piss off. And then uh, The Rock is shown in prison with Jason Statham. So, oh. yeah. That's, that's like, okay. there's, so there's like both them in prison jumpsuits in orange, like about to fight each other as one scene in the trailer. That looks like fun. So mm-hmm. Kurt Russell's like, okay, you guys have no choice, but now that Vin Diesel has gone bad, you have to work with Jason Statham. And everyone is like, no, we hate him. <laughs> you know, it, it sounds exactly like what I expected a Furious movie to be. Yeah. I hope it's fun. Me too. It's directed by F. Gary Gray, and I love his remake of Italian Drop. I think that is really entertaining. Okay. Yeah, with Charlie Theron, Mark Wahlberg, and Edward Norton. So it's the same director as that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Helen Mirren isn't in this trailer yet, though. I, I'm looking forward to seeing her in this movie. Maybe she kisses Vin Diesel too. I don't know. Yeah, that'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> it's like a hot threesome with Vin Diesel, Charlie Theron, and Helen Mirren. <laughs> you think like he's brainwashed or something? I hope not. I think that'll be a bit too sci-fi. I think he's playing a long con. I think he's he's yeah. I think it's some sort of deep undercover thing. Well, let's just see what movie Paul Paul Walken. Paul Walker. Damn it. Paul Walker. Paul Walker. Sent Walker from sorry. Heaven. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, it's yes. a terrible thing Let, to laugh Let's see what about. movie Paul Walker has for us in this. Oh, yeah. Um, um, I, I, sorry. I, 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 I hate to keep on doing this, but I just wrote like a list of all the movies coming out next year. So Dunkirk, Dunkirk, the Christopher Nolan War movie. Have you seen the trailer for that yet? No, that's the one I want to try to avoid because okay. it's Christopher Nolan. Right, I understand. Yeah. Looks good. Looks very good. And a lot of prestigious English actors in it, like Kenneth Branagh and Harry oh. Styles of One Direction. Oh, what? Yeah. His, his, his movie debut. Okay. Yeah. I hope I hope he's not in it just because he's Harry Styles. Well, it's Christopher Nolan. I think we can trust yes, him. Yes, Tom Hardy, Killian Murphy. Lots of great actors okay. in there. Yeah. And uh, Mark oh. Rylance from Ridge of Spies. He's a good actor. Okay. Yep. I've never heard of him. I'm sorry. Oh, he's the guy who won Best Supporting Actor for Bridge of Spies. He played the... Oh, Bridge of Bridge Spies. Bridge of Spies, okay. yeah. He played the Russian oh. guy, yeah. Oh my god, I'm so embarrassed. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's alright. He's in the BFG too. Yes, right? Mark Rylance, yeah. So he's... Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's in it. He's one of the civilians whose boats had to turn around to go to Dunkirk. Mm, okay. Yep. Hey. Sorry, I cut you off when you're about to go on to something. I'm very rude this episode. No, it's Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're not being rude at all. Thank you. Um, the next, so next week, I love great films. The Great Wall is coming out. Are you gonna watch? I that? missed the screening for that. I think it was on the same night as Assassin's Creed. I'm so sorry. I know. Would yeah. you have? Do you regret it? I'm not sure. You know, honestly, because I think this, I think the Great Wall looks like crap. I think it's gonna, but I think it's gonna be interesting crap because it's a mismatch. It's Zhang Yimou trying to do a Zhang Yimou thing in what is ostensibly a Hollywood movie. And whenever people do East meets West things in Hollywood in a big budget fantasy context, it does not work. It hasn't worked yet. It Unless you're Mulan. Well, in a big budget fantasy, like a live action context. So, okay. yeah. I'm, because what this made me think of was Dragon Blade, which is Jackie Chan hanging out with John Cusack fighting Adrian mm. Brody in the desert, which was hilarious. And yeah. In a good way? In a bad way. It's very, very bad. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's weird because none of those actors look like they could pull off that sort of period role. And it's very, you need a lot of suspension of disbelief. But I like Pedro Pascal and Willem Dafoe is in this as well. And on the Chinese actor side, you have uh, Andy Lau. You have Luhan. Uh, Luhan. And then there's another boy band kid, right? Wang Chuntai or something. Yeah. yeah, oh my gosh. So, I don't know. And Xing Tian, the pretty lady, she is going to be Legendary's emissary to Hollywood because they have her in Kong Skull Island and Pacific Rim 2, which is being called Uprising, I think, is the new name that's being mm-hmm. called. Yeah. I'm so I'm so excited for that. Um, okay, Me too. next yeah, John is Real... Railroad Tigers. Oh, I watched that. Jackie Chan film. Yeah. Oh, how was it? Is it fun? It's fun, yeah. Um, it's oh, okay, yeah. that's great because like the trailers were so terrible. It's it's fun, but at the same time, it has that thing where there are way too many characters. So uh, yeah, you have. I to... mean, to be, I mean, like I don't really enjoy. I shouldn't say this because film is subjective, but I I'm not a fan of like Chinese films with martial arts in them because a lot of them are so much style almost no story yes I totally understand that and um, I think I like Railroad Tigers because it reminded me a little bit of the Dirty Dozen where it's set during World War 2 and you have this plucky band of small time rebels and they're trying to hijack a Japanese military transport so the tone of it is actually kind of adventure driven and light and the way they portray the Japanese in this movie they're kind of complete buffoons it's, it's like the Nazis in Indiana Jones which, yeah, mm-hmm. is a little bit problematic, but I think it fits the tone. It's not an overly serious war film. And I like Jackie Chan's role in this, in that he he, ca- he tends to be very, very egotistical. And he tends to, like, get the most beautiful co-star to play his love interest. But in this movie, it's kind of a regular... She's The character sells pancakes, and she looks like a, an auntie who would sell pancakes, and she's the love interest. I love that. I think she she was a great part of the movie. Okay, that's great. Yeah. And you know what? I'm interested in the next film. It's called Why Him? With Brian Yeah, Hansen and okay. James All right. That looks really fun. Yeah. I'm watching that, that. I'm watching that tomorrow night. Uh, actually, I'm trying to find someone to come along with me, and the person might not be free. So, uh, might you, like, not guarantee, but might you be free on the 27th of December? Oh, I'm sorry. I have to go USS. I see. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm I, for some reason, I'm having problems finding people to go with me. Like this has gotten really, really bad reviews. But I like Ryan Cranston a lot, and I love Zoe Deutsch. I have a huge crush on Zoe Deutsch after seeing her and stuff. And I think she has like all the best 
elements of Leia Thompson while also being a different person from her mom. Mm-hmm. And James Franco, I like him when he's being goofy. I think he's one of those actors who's slightly better at comedy than drama. Oh, really? Yeah, a little bit. Oh, I, I like him in his dramatic roles, but I think he has a very funny face. Yes, that's true. So I love true. him in comedies as well. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, I, I think that an actor whose true calling is comedy rather than drama is Mark Wahlberg. Like, I can't take Mark Wahlberg seriously in a lot of stuff. And that's one mm. of the problems I had with Patriot's Day. Oh, yeah, okay. he always has this face, and this this face that he has is somewhere between being surprised and about to sneeze. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And that's how he reacts to everything that goes on around him in Patriot's Day. <laughs> yep. So, the light between oceans, I think, has been delayed a little bit, right? That's the romance. I think. I think that's next two weeks from right. Now. Yeah, that's not great. That's not great. No, yeah, it's kind of a soppy, old-fashioned romance. It's really slow. It sounds exactly like an Oscar bait. Though. Yeah, it's yeah, it it's a bit like the English Patient, and I mean. Alicia Vikander and Michael Fassbender are very pretty and they have very good chemistry, but it's it tries too hard to be emotionally manipulative and there are a lot of coincidences in the plot. There's a film that's coming out, I think, three weeks from now. It's a it's a Ben Affleck directed oh, film. Oh, Liv- it's getting really bad reviews. I'm really, really people don't Live like Live by Night. I'm kind of shocked. I thought people would love Live by Night. I'm really. It sad. looks good. It looks is the one with good. Zoe Saldana, yeah. right? And and Elle Fanning. Mm. Elle Fanning, yeah. I'm not sure about Zoe Saldana. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Zoe Saldana is in it. And it's, oh yeah, she's in it. She's in it's it. It's set in like 30s Miami against Prohibition. That looked good. When I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, this looks like fun. Ah, oh, mm. I'm kind of shocked that it's not getting good reviews. I'm really sad that it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I really love Ben Affleck as a director and, and a writer. Uh, I think his writing is a lot more... I, I think his... I prefer his writing over his directing. But... Yeah, you know... There's nothing wrong with being both, and sure, yeah. he, he he he's doing both. Like he's, you know what? He's a big three in this. He's producing, he's directing, and he he wrote it. Yeah, and it's adapted. So it's really sad that it's not great. It's adapted from a novel by Dennis Lehane, who wrote um, Gone Baby Gone, which is the oh. yeah the the first the first uh, movie that he directed, and he is directing and I think co-writing Batman. So. With, uh, fingers crossed. Yeah, with Jeff Johns, and that's gonna have Joe Manganiello as the bad guy. So fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Yeah, please, please, please. I want to know more about what happened to Jason. Please, please, please. <laughs> I love Red Hood so much. <laughs> Jason Todd for Jason Todd for Batman. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go. All right. Um. So that's it for the show. Yeah. And Hopefully, I can edit this and then put it up online without before any... the new year's done. Yeah. Any problem, yep. And that's it for 2016. And I just wanted to say, you know, thanks so much for letting me be a part of this show. Uh, I've done, I think, about 10, 11 months on this show. And it's been really, really fun. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks. Because, I mean, you can talk about films way more competently than I can. So <laughs> it's nice to have someone to bounce off of and to learn from. Oh, that means a lot to hear. I, I've, I've been learning from you as well. And yeah, thanks for... For for really, you know, I think the discussions you've had are fun, even though we agree a lot of the time. I think that I, I feel like it's worthwhile and I like listening back to the episodes, partly because I'm narcissistic and partly because you bring a lot to this. I, I appreciate it. Thank You're you. You're welcome. It's the truth. That's really nice. At least I brought something to something. <laughs> okay, so see you guys next year. Yeah, we'll see everybody in 2017, which hopefully will have lots and lots of great movies. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.